but we have run behind time. I think that's all that. My second example of the usefulness of an ecological approach to medicine has quite a different history. It concerns the work of a very remarkable man, the late F. M. Alexander. His research started some 50 years before the revival of ethology for which we are now being honored. Yet his procedure was very similar to modern observational methods. And we believe that his achievements and those of his pupils deserve close attention. Alexander was born in 1869 in Tasmania. And he became at an early age a reciter of dramatic and humorous pieces. He was not a medical man, he was an actor. Very soon, he developed serious vocal trouble, and he came very near to losing his voice altogether. When no doctor could help him, he took matters into his own hands. He began to observe himself in a mirror while he was reciting and while he was feeling he was losing his voice. And then he noticed that his voice was at its worst when he adopted the stances which to him felt appropriate and right for what he was reciting. Without any outside help, he worked out during a series of really agonizing years, it has been well recorded, how to improve what is now called the use of his body musculature, I'm trying to imitate what he is doing, in all his postures and movements. And the remarkable result was that he regained control of his voice. And this story of perceptiveness, of high intelligence, of persistence, showed by a man without any scientific training whatsoever, is, we think, one of the true epics of medical research and practice. Once Alexander had become aware of the misuse of his own body, he began to observe his fellow men, and he found that, at least in modern Western society, the majority of people, all of us, stand, sit, and move in an equally defective manner. Now encouraged by Dr. Sidney, he now became a kind of missionary. He set out to teach first actors, then a variety of people, how to restore the proper use of the musculature. And gradually he discovered that he could in this way alleviate an astonishing variety of somatic and mental illnesses. He also wrote extensively on the subject, and finally, he taught a number of his pupils to become teachers in their turn and to achieve the same results with their patients. Whereas it had taken him years to work out a technique and to apply to his own body, a successful course now is a matter of months with occasional refresher sessions afterwards. Admittedly, the training of a good Alexander teacher takes a few years. For scores of years, a small but very dedicated number of pupils, and there's one of them here in Stockholm, Mr. Beasley, and I hope he's among the audience, have continued his work. Their combined successes have recently, recently been described by Barlow. And I must admit that his physiological explanation of how the treatment could be supposed to work, and also a touch of hero worship in his book, made me initially a little doubtful and even skeptical. But the claims made, first by Alexander, and reiterated and extended by Barlow, sounded so extraordinary that I felt I ought to give the method at least the benefit of the doubt. And so, by arguing that medical practice often goes by the sound empirical principle of the proof of the pudding is in the eating, my wife, one of my daughters, and I myself, decided to undergo treatment ourselves and also to use the opportunity for observing its effects as critically as we could. For obvious reasons, each of us went to a different Alexander teacher. Fortunately, there are quite a number of them in southern Britain. We discovered that the therapy is based on exceptionally sophisticated observation, not only by means of vision, but also to a surprising extent by using the sense of touch in a very gentle way. It consists in essence of no more than a very gentle, first exploratory and then corrective manipulation of the entire muscular system. It starts with the head and neck, 
Then very soon the shoulders and chest are involved, and finally the pelvis, legs and feet, until the whole body is under scrutiny and treatment. Continuous monitoring by touch and vision and treatment. Between the three of us, we already notice, with growing amazement, very striking improvements in such diverse things as the disappearance of eudema due to high blood pressure, depth of breathing, depth of sleep, overall cheerfulness and mental alertness, resilience against outside pressures such as Nobel Prize winners experience at home, and also in such a refined skill as playing a stringed instrument. That's the variety of improvements we notice in ourselves. So from personal experience we can already confirm some of the seemingly fantastic claims, seemingly fantastic, made by Alexander and his followers. Namely that many types of underperformance and even ailments, both mental and physical, can be alleviated, sometimes to a surprising extent, by teaching the body musculature to function differently. And although we have by no means finished our course, the evidence given and documented by Alexander and Barlow of beneficial effects on a variety of vital functions no longer sounds so astonishing to us. Now I will cut my lecture short here, but the examples will come in the print version. The importance of the treatment has been stressed by many prominent people, for instance by John Dewey, Aldous Huxley, and perhaps more convincing to us by scientists of renown such as Coghill, the anatomist, Raymond Dart, and the great neurophysiologist Sherrington. Yet, with few exceptions, the medical profession have largely ignored Alexander, perhaps under the impression that he was the center of some kind of cult, and also because the effects seem so difficult to explain. And this brings me to my next point. Once one knows that an empirically developed therapy has demonstrable effect, one likes to know how it could work, how its physiological mechanism could be explained. And there, the modern literature, but again, I will not take the time to mention it, uh, does help us a little in understanding what is really happening during the deterioration of the use of our body by continuous sitting from six years or five years on and the veering back on the short treatment to what must be highly environment resistant usage of your body musculature in the function, in the service of the upright stance. I would merely like to show you a few slides taken from Barlow to make clear to you what exactly I'm talking about and then I will wind up. Could I have the next slide please? This is the usual slumping posture in which already now many young people are sitting and many of us are forced to sit. Could I have the next slide please? Left slumping posture in a young boy, center over strained on the right the natural sitting posture. Next slide please. Slumped posture, watch the pelvis the vertebral column and particularly the curious S-bend in the neck which we all know and which I'm now forcing upon you. <laughs> Next slide please. <coughs> on the left the way we stand, on the right the way our ancestors stood and the way we stand after treatment. And the last slide, <laughs> seen from behind, on the left before treatment, on the right after treatment. Watch in particular the unnecessary tension in the buttocks, the tension in the sh shoulder blades and the ne neck region. All that disappears. In other words, what the Alexander treatment achieves is a redeployment and an overall economy in the use of your body musculature. 